So our verses this morning come from Mark 15, 6, verse 6 through 15. All right, so starting. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. And verse 7, the man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release you for the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! But Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. eyes of our heart. Lord, help us to receive from you directly. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we just kind of read that little section of scripture knowing that today is a, a communion study and, you know, I'm sure some people are wondering, um, that's not the section of scripture that you would normally read for, or only that section of scripture for a communion study, but I love the fact that each time that we um, take set aside a whole day for communion on our communion Sundays, we can um, approach communion from different angles. I don't even, I don't think we would ever exhaust all of the different angles that we could approach a study in communion and what Jesus has done for our salvation, for our atonement, for all of that reconciliation to God. But today is one of those angles that we're going to come at from a little bit different view um, than just the normal. So all four Gospels, all four Gospels deem it very necessary, apparently, um, to mention Barabbas, this depraved criminal, this guy that has in done some pretty awful things. He's now in prison. He is on death row. He's awaiting to be crucified um, or put to death. We know that Barabbas, um, that a lot of his crimes were against Rome. That's a that's a that's an obvious thing because um, if he was going to be crucified, he was up for crucifixion. That was held for in normal circumstances for those people that committed a crime against Rome. So we know that he was that. Um, Josephus kind of gives us some of the background and the story of that, that Pilate wanted to build this aqueduct, right? That, um, that came to Jerusalem from different areas, but he wanted to use um, some of the temple money, <laughs> Hey, look at that. You guys got a bunch of money in the church. Let's borrow some of that money to build an aqueduct. And so he was going to do this aqueduct. And the Jews decided that they didn't want him to use their money because it was their money. It was not God's money. It was their money. So um, they started a riot. And this is all the historical account from Josephus. So they start a riot and... This thing's beginning bigger and bigger and bigger. And so Pilate decides that he's going to quell this riot. So he takes a bunch of his Roman soldiers and he puts normal clothes over their 
you know, armor and their uniform and everything like that. And he disperses all of these Roman soldiers out amongst the crowd and they just look like one of the crowd. And then all of a sudden, at the right signal, off come the robes and the whole crowd is surrounded by Roman soldiers and the beatdown ensues. There is tons of Jews that were beaten, arrested, killed, but in the insurrection, there was a bunch of Jews that were breaking the law as well, murdering people and things like that. So similarly, um, <clears throat> or Josephus records it was about 10,000 people that were involved in this riot. So it was not what like some of us have seen riots, you know, where there's, you know, some Southerns against, you know, whoever the, you know, Northerns or something like that, where you have a hundred people and over here, there was like 10,000 people that were involved in this riot. So Barabbas was part of that insurrection riot that was going on. Not only being part of the insurrection, he exceeded the rest of the zealots that were doing this thing. He added to his repertoire, his rap sheet, rebellion, robbery, murder, Okay, enough so that it was not just in the insurrection, but it was here and there and, and everywhere that he became known. He became famous for it. He was a famous criminal. And here we are with that guy. And in contrast, you have Jesus, who Pilate says in so many words, hasn't done anything guilty of deserving death. We got this dude and we got Jesus. And Pilate says, he hasn't done anything. I find no guilt in this guy. Peter mentions Barabbas um, in Acts. And it's probably a good time now for me to tell you the title of our message because everybody's kind of going, well, this does not sound like a good message. This does not sound like a communion message. This sounds... Kind of like a downer message. Um, title of the message is We Are Barabbas. So if you're thinking any of those things, it's going to get worse for you. <laughs> but Peter mentions Barabbas in Acts. Acts 3.14 says, But you, talking to the Jews, um, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. So he's reminding the Jews of what they did. One way to summarize Barabbas, if we're thinking about this, one way to summarize Barabbas would be to say that he was guilty of rebellion, guilty of robbery, guilty of murder, definitely deserving death, a criminal on the brink of receiving his execution. So he was on death row. He was, he had been tried. He'd been found guilty of all of his treasonous actions, punishment was capital, and they about ready to be carried out to the fullest extent. And he deserved every bit of it, right? And I know at first glance, when we look at the story of Barabbas and Jesus, most of us go, oh, seriously, those Jews asked for him and he got saved and Jesus had to die? The, the horror of it, the right? A guilty man set free and an innocent man sent sentenced to death. It's not fair. Well, like I said, um, at the, a little bit, a few minutes ago, this message will probably get worse if that's the only thing that you can think of right here. Um, but as we go into this, as this message declines, okay, um, I want, as Paul gave the admonition for approaching communion to examine ourselves this is the time for examination as we look at this study this is the time that we should be comparing looking at and seeing the different aspects of things that we need to deal with before we come into communion because this is a communion study so with that as we examine the first thing in we are Barabbas is we deserve to die just like, just like Barabbas. Whether or not we like it, Barabbas 
actually represents every one of us. He represents all of humanity. Um, the rebel prisoner guilty of crimes that are deserving of death, whether it's physical crimes or spiritual crimes or whatever, our sin nature has removed us from, why? Well, I'm not guilty. No, we're guilty. Every single one of us are guilty, worthy of death because we're sinners. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So understanding that, we understand, you know what? We deserve, just like Barabbas, death. That's our sentence. That's our penalty. And, and we know that we can't save each other. We can't avoid, like Romans here says, avoid getting paid our wages. That's what we earned. Those are our wages. That's our punishment. It must be paid. Must be paid. God is a just God, and the penalty is death. And if God does not pay or require that penalty to be paid, then God's not just, right? It had to be paid one way or the other. And we know that we can't pay that penalty because there's nothing that we can offer to atone for what we've done. Isaiah 64, 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And so, some of you might be thinking, okay, yeah, but... Yeah, but I might be, you know, unclean or a little bit unrighteous. I'm a sinner, but I'm not like Barabbas. I mean, come on, think about it. We have all these things that he did. I'm not doing those things. I haven't murdered anyone. I'm not on death row. I'm not in prison, right? But what I want to do is take some time to look at what the other gospels say about Barabbas. Because we read it in Mark. But what do the other ones say? Matthew 27, 16. And look at that. That's the, it's not up there. But that is Matthew 27, 16. It says, at that time, they were holding a notorious, notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Matthew says notorious. Oxford's, Oxford's Dictionary says notorious means famous or well-known, typically for some bad quality or bad deed. So when we look at that, we go, we, like Barabbas, are notorious sinners. We're all famous for being sinners. I, I can say, hey, you know me. And if you know me, you know I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm notorious for it. I do it. I'm not confessing anything new that anybody, this is not a revelation that I sin every single day. And I think that's why most of us are here this morning is because we know we're sinners in need of a savior. We're notorious for it. Ephesians 2 verse 3 says, We too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature, that's our just natural, that's in us, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest, even as what he's saying is even as every other sinner out there, you're just like every other sinner. You're famous for it. You can't be not famous for it. So you go, well, okay, I guess if you put it that way, I, I might be a little bit like Barabbas and I'm a sinner. Yeah, I'm a sinner. I just don't being like, I don't like being called that. I'm, I might be a sinner, but I'm still a sensitive sinner. Come on, you don't need to point these things out that that deeply in Romans Paul says that 
both Jews and Greeks, or Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and you, basically, is what we can translate that out, um, are all under sin. We're, we're, there's, nothing, there's no getting out of underneath the weight of our sin. We're all under sin. We are all these notorious, wicked little sinners. And then Paul goes on and he quotes Psalm 14 when he says, There is none who understand. There is none who seek for God. And, and we're going, well, wait a minute. That's what we're doing here this morning. But this is before God reveals himself to us. This is before God calls us. When we're still in that state of sin, that depravity, before that reconciliation happens, before that regeneration happens, we are all underneath that sin. None who seek God. Like I, like I really want to press in there, that is until God reveals himself to us. But before that, we're all, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner who needed Jesus. And so I can align myself just like Barabbas, just like he was a sinner, a, a desperate sinner. He had no, no understanding, no concept, no idea that he needed to be saved, which was me. I, I was the same way until Jesus revealed himself to us. The next thing we want to look at, we'll look at Luke. Luke 23, 19 says, he was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. So Luke describes Barabbas as an insurrectionist. And we look at that word and we go, oh, wait a minute, hold on now. That's not me. That's not me. I'm not an insurrectionist. That's not a really good sounding word if you're going to describe my friends or if I try to describe my wife. Yeah, my wife's a little insurrectionist, right? Now, she might say that about me and it's absolutely 100% true. But we look at that word and we kind of go, oh, I don't, I don't know. That doesn't describe me. I've, I've never... I've never started a riot. I've never tried to overthrow the government like they were trying to do. But understand this. An in, insurrectionist is just a fancy word for rebel. Fancy word for a rebel. And what is a rebel? A rebel is, is someone who wants to do their own thing no matter what the rules are. An insurrectionist is one of, I want to do my own will rather than what God's will is. I was made for this, but I don't want to do that. I want to do whatever. C.S. Lewis writes this. This is such a cool little quote when you really get down and think about it. A creature revolting against a creator is revolting against the source of his own power, including even his power to revolt. It's like the scent of a flower trying to destroy the flower. That's us. That's our sin nature. That's, that is what is in us. Every human heart has that seed or fragrance of, of rebellion that's, that's germinating within us. That is sin. Every one of us have that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else, than everything else, and is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And so, again, comparing ourselves to Barabbas, that's all of us. That's every single one of us. Trying to do our own thing, rebelling against God, yeah, there are days, there, I have good days where I'm really trying to do what God has, but then I'm not going to lie. I got days that I want to do my thing. My thing. That's rebellion against God. We are, like Barabbas, little insurrectionists. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all 
to fall on him. Man, that's an amen right there. Our problems, our sin, our rebellion, now he carries or carried. I love that. But we have all gone astray. We've all turned our own direction. We've all that turning our own direction is rebelling against the Lord. That is the epitome of rebellion. So the next thing, we are Barabbas. We'll go to John, John 18, 40. So they cried out again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. And John gives the little footnote. Now Barabbas was a robber. Barabbas was a robber. And so people listening to the message and probably off of YouTube later are going to go, okay, John's really trying too hard to make points out of a message right now. That's kind of silly because, you know, I'm not a robber. I haven't uh, shoplifted. I haven't stolen a car. I didn't break into somebody's house and steal things. I never robbed a bank. I can't be considered a robber or a thief. Especially, I mean, some of us are in law enforcement. We can't be a law enforcement guy and be a robber at the same time. Let me ask it in a different way, though. As a robber, more than earthly terms, more than items here on earth, have you ever robbed, and this is a great discussion that I've had with Brian a little bit, have you ever robbed God of anything? And and I'm not talking about stealing money from God, right? You can't really steal money from God. You can't really... God, he's in control of everything. You can't steal things that he already has. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. And we're not under the the Old Testament law of some of those requirements that we have to give a certain amount of money where they've referred to. If you don't tithe a certain amount, you're stealing from God. And that's, that's not what we're even talking about. But what we are talking about is what can we steal from God? What can we steal from God? Is it even possible? You know, it's not like, okay, well, Jesus had a, his favorite carpenter's pencil and I was over there one time and I slipped it in my pocket and got out, right? It, it's not that. We're not physically doing or stealing some type of object from God. We're stealing something that is owed to God. If we don't give something to God that is owed to him, we're stealing it from him. We're not stealing from him. We're stealing it before we even give it to him. What does he do? That's the question. What does God do? God is due, right? What we should be giving him is our wholehearted love. Our wholehearted love and devotion. We should be giving God our complete trust complete and utter trust our unwavering obedience <laughs> unwavering obedience non-stop service we should be serving the lord in every single thing that we do non-stop from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed non-stop worship and i know for a fact that none of you myself included can say that we do those things perfectly, even close to perfectly, right? At all times, because remember, we're rebels. We rebel against those things. God deserves nothing less than the absolute best of our time, attention, obedience, and devotion. But we make choices. We make choices during the day. Oh yeah, you know what, Lord? I know you kind of put it on my heart to just stop and pray for a little bit. But I really got to get that chore done. I really got, right? We Little things like that. And it's not a legalism thing, but it's, it's a heart thing that we should be giving to the Lord. And 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We are not our own. And everything that we have, everything that we do, every attitude, every thought, every those aren't ours anymore because we have been purchased. We have been bought. So we belong to him. They are his. They're God's. And we owe God everything, our very life. So when we do not give that over to him, what else are we to be considered but less than a thief, robbing God of what he is due, holding on to something that is that is really, it's not ours. It's not ours to keep. It's not ours. Th- my worship, it's not our, mine. It's, it's, it's God's and I should be giving it to him. Ah, but I'm not in the mood right now. Excuse me. Things like that. C.H. Spurgeon says this. You and I may fairly take our stand by the side of Barabbas. We have robbed God of his glory. We have been seditious traitors against the government of heaven. He doesn't mince words right there. If he who hated his brother be a murderer, also we have been guilty of that sin. Here we stand before the judgment seat of the prince of life, or before the judgment seat, the prince of life is bound for us and we are suffered to go free. We rob God of of things that we should give him, our time, our devotion, our love, our adoration, our whatever it is. Remember, it's not the physical legal things. It's, it's, what he's due, his glory. So we are Barabbas, robbers. Okay, so we'll move on. Looking back at at Mark here, 15.7 says, the man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder. We saw that that, uh, Peter in Acts talked about, hey, you set loose this murderer and then we kind of think of that, okay, well, now you've, you've kind of gone too far. I can see how we've robbed God of my time or my devotion or my worship or robbed him of his glory. Not that I could take any of his glory, but what I should be giving him. But I, I've never murdered somebody, like murdered, murdered somebody, right? At least I look around the room and hope that nobody's actually murdered, murdered somebody. Looks don't count. Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount that God's law is not, God's law is not just our outward actions. God's law is not just the things that we do. It all starts in the inward. It's not just the outward. It all starts in the inward of our heart. If we have been wrongly angry, we have murdered yeah, but there's a difference when you think about that. If we've been wrong and we've murdered, well, okay, I understand what Jesus is saying, but there's a difference between um, physical murder murdering somebody and the thinking murder murdering somebody, right? There's got to be a difference. One's not actually as bad as the other because the other person, if I just think it murder, murder, then that person's still alive. But if I take a knife and murder, murder, then he's not alive anymore. So one's obviously worse than the other, at least we hope. But Jesus, like I said in Matthew 5, 21 to 22, he says, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. You're guilty. That's what it means. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing. I love it. You good for nothing. Shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. So now we're even elevating. We're going to a higher court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough 
to go into the fiery hell. What? You mean thinking murder murder is is worse sometimes than physical murder murder? Wow, that's what Jesus is saying. I like the NLT, the New Living Translation says, if you call someone an idiot and curse them. If you call somebody an idiot and curse them, boy, I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. You know, I mean, I'm going to have to remove that one from my vocabulary because I'm guilty of murder all the time. It's a heart issue, though, is what Jesus is, is getting at. Murder by anger, insults, or hatred. We're all guilty of those. It doesn't matter. We're all guilty. So right now, let's summarize to this point. We are notorious sinners in God's eyes. Rebels against his commands. Even more, we rob God of things that he's due. We harbor murder in our heart. So so far, we're seeing that we are just as bad as Barabbas, deserving of every just penalty God brings our way. We deserve it. We have earned it. That's our wages. Our outward actions might not be as heinous as what Barabbas did physically, but our hearts are just as rebellious and wicked and sinful. Like I said, this message was kind of going to start going downhill you know this fluffy little Jesus is love message this is not one of those <sighs> the last one that we'll look at the last way that we are like Barabbas and this is a big one we are Barabbas because just like Barabbas we did not earn Excuse me, we did not earn our pardon. Just like Barabbas, he didn't earn his pardon. He didn't do anything good for it. Pilate said, you don't want me to give you this dude? Come on, this dude's not guilty. This guy's guilty. This guy's not guilty. Let me set him free. Nothing that Barabbas did or could have done could excuse his behavior or remove his punishment. You know, Barabbas didn't even ask for his pardon. He was stuck in a prison cell. He didn't say, hey, hey, Pilate, I know you're thinking of setting a couple people free. Maybe, you know, send some love this way. He didn't ask for that. It was just given to him freely. Just hand it over. We're the same way. There's nothing that, that we could do to pay for or to earn any part of our salvation. Nothing. Our pardon comes to us before, really, before we even know that we need to be pardoned because we're so stuck in our sin. That's how good God is. That's how wonderful His grace is. Before Christ, we're so blinded in our sin and hostile towards God Everything we do has flesh and death written all over it. That's before Christ. We were talking just this morning, spiritually. We're a dead person. Dead spiritually. What can a dead person do to get life? Nothing. They can't do anything. They're dead. Romans 8, 6-8 says, For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so. It can't even do it. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So before Christ, we are that dead person. Dead, can't do nothing. But Christ and Christ alone. There's no reason, just like Barabbas, there's no reason that we could ever come up with for Jesus to take our place. 
There's there's nothing. Oh, well, okay, now I did a good deed and that should be compensated. There's the factors that resulted in Barabbas's pardon are the same factors that have resulted in ours. It, it was unearned, undeserved. It, he didn't do anything for it. And that's the same with us because it's Christ and Christ alone. And the innocent took his place. Jesus on one side, innocent. Barabbas, guilty on this side. The innocent took his place. That is a free gift of grace. And that's how exactly how God's salvation is offered to every sinner. If we think we deserve it, if we think that we could somehow pay for it with like corruptible things like we talked about silver or gold or or even works or good deeds, then, then we just don't understand what grace is. We don't understand what salvation is because we're still looking at us going, oh yeah, I deserve. No, you don't. Not at all. We miss the whole point all the way around. Romans 5, 6 says, for while we were still helpless, useless, I'm going to add a few other words in here. We were helpless, useless, remember, hostile towards God, blinded in our sin, able to do nothing, dead spiritually. At the right time, Christ died for those, the ungodly. We had no control. We had no input. We had no clout. We had no say. All we can do is recognize that God offered our pardon freely he pardoned us even though we didn't deserve it we don't deserve it just like barabbas and that's what we're remembering today in so many ways we are barabbas we are exactly like barabbas you want to do those So when I mentioned that examine yourself as we got started, this time of examining ourselves is to see our wickedness, to see our robbery, to see our rebellion, to see our all of those things, the murder that we have, each one of us have in our heart. Those are the things that we need to remember. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, and we are just like Barabbas, stuck on death row, condemned to die for everything that we deserve to die for. While we were yet sinners, thank you, Christ died for us. So today, here we are to remember those things. We are Barabbas receiving this undeserved pardon, right? A guilty criminal describing us set free while an innocent God died in our place. That, that's what all of this is representing. And remember the C.H. Spurgeon says, here we stand before the judgment seat, that's us, and the prince of life is bound for us and we're suffered to go free. We get to go free. An innocent dies and the guilty goes free so this bread jesus told us this bread represents his body it represents our hope and our our glory this bread represents that free pardon that we have just like barabbas 
that we didn't deserve, we didn't earn, we're not good enough to receive. But while we were still hostile, Christ loved us more than we could understand. It says in Matthew 26, 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And that's what we're doing this morning is we were remembering. Let's take, let's partake together. Lord, we thank you for your body that you willingly, Lord, you willingly allowed to go through the beating, the scourging, the nails, the thorns. Lord, we thank you for that. We remember that and we remember that you did that for us, the guilty. You did that to set us free. Lord, we thank you. Now we have the cup. This cup of reminding us of the atoning sacrifice that only the innocent, that only Jesus could fulfill. It represents the propitiation to God with a sufficient sacrifice that none of us could, I mean, we couldn't, we can't we can't we can't even come close we can't even begin to try it represents the blood of the innocent that was shed for us the criminal ephesians 1 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that is what we're here for Jesus willingly, literally poured out his blood to ransom us so that we wouldn't have to pour out our blood. Continuing in Matthew, he says, And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Lord, we, we thank you for your blood. We thank you that we are redeemed through your blood and that your forgiveness for, covers our trespasses. Lord, we thank you that it is by the, the richness of your grace that we are saved. Lord, we remember today. Let's all partake. Lord, as we uh, continue our day, as we sit down together and talk about your word and try to even unpack even more, help us not to stop, Lord, um, examining ourselves. Help us to not stop thinking how we are like Barabbas. And we, we don't deserve because when we understand, the more fully we understand that, Lord, the more we, we can learn to love and, and rejoice in what you have given us, what you have blessed us with. Lord, it's all you, nothing of ourselves. Jesus, it is all you, and you're the one that we remember now. In Jesus' name. Amen.